Well, good afternoon. I'm Wayne. That's me. Chad said we have to start. He didn't want me to remind you there's two other meetings going on, so you certainly feel free to go to something that's worthwhile. But I'm going to uh, I'm going to relive my life for you. Okay. Uh, the uh, the title is uh, Growing Grass and Learning Since 1955. That's not when I was born. Okay. I'm a 42 model, but 55 is when I started 4-H. Uh, oh Alan Newport met me one day and I was wearing a John Deere cap and a yellow shirt, so the local John Deere dealer was really happy uh, with the article that was in the Beef Producer. And it talks about most everything I'm doing, so if you need notes, Melinda, just find that and, and you'll have it. Here's where it started, a great busy bees 4-H club. One of the first 4-H clubs in the United States that had its own band. But uh, I learned some things. Montana had a range management project that took four years. And basically, it's Range Management 101 put in a form for, for kids. And our county agent, I'll talk about the old county agent first, was an old, old guy named Dean Davidson. And I didn't realize how old he was because I met his family one day and the kids were like four and six years old, so I knew he was really old. The moral of the story. As I got out in life, I figured out that a lot of people had done a lot of good things for me, and he did. And I was always going to tell him, but geez, he's so old, he must have died a long, long time ago. He wasn't that old, but he died before I found him. So somebody that's done something for you in your life, reach out and touch them before the first of the year, because they're not that old and they're still around. But we spent over four years, and there was only five of us, because that's how many fit in his car. And we'd spend days, days together, we'd camp out overnight on the range once in a while. And Melinda, that's where I learned a new plant ID. And we collected about 100 plants in Richland County. And you do that to a young kid, and uh, you're a 4-H leader, you'll ruin them forever. Okay? <laughs> because that's, they just look at plants the rest of their life. And so that's where I got started. I fooled a lot of uh, students through time. Uh, they think that I'm uh, kind of trained in range. I'm a agricultural economist. Confession is good for the soul. I feel better now. Okay, but but range of grass was my passion, and that worked out. Uh, my bride Sharon is sitting right here, the brains of the outfit. So if uh, if something comes up that you think is good, thank her, because my mind goes in 67 directions on a slow day, and I can't count them on the other days. And she's the force that says, "Wainer, why are you doing that?" And that means it's time to do something else. Okay, let's do a little math. 1957, 1942. Um, 15 years old. Is that right? In 57. That's a picture of the folks' farm. This is on the front page of the Richland County, Montana Conservation Newsletter. <laughs> this is a bridge in a coulee on Highway 201. Highway engineers are smart enough to know where to build bridges because water runs under them. <laughs> That's water running across my folks' tilled fields in the spring runoff. And this is a picture of the perfect example of bad things to do. I don't know about you, but as a 15-year-old Robin Stoppin' farm kid that thought I was on the greatest farm in the world, it crushed me. Changed my life. You slice the veins and conservation runs out. There's the bridge. There's Teddy the Border Collie. 2010. It ain't gonna wash now. The other thing that's going on, it's not all that we did, it's not a very big watershed, but most of it's in CRP and the rest of it, instead of being in crop fallow going up and down the field, is in no-till and has kept a cover up. So the water, we're not getting as much water. Water still runs under the bridge, but not the volume that it did, but it's not going to wash anymore. So we went through contours and a number of things. Another influence on my life was Sand County Almanac by Olga Leopold. Leopold Award. I've been to the shack. It's uh, it, it's you know father of conservation, father of big game management. Uh, you get in the right circles, and people found out that I've been in the in the uh, in the shack. You know, and they want to come and say, "Man." Some people some people get really 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 fired up about the old and I mean he was he was a thinker. He was ahead of his time, and so that got me going. So he said that the first tool of intelligent tinkering is to save all the pieces. Okay? 
that's that's in his writing. I found it. Okay. I had to dig and I found this one because Alan Savory said, well, although Leopold, that chap said, the tool of destruction will be the ultimate tool of restoration, the cow. I'm kind of hearing that now, aren't I, about uh, things we're trying to do to rebuild soil and do some things. Are, are we talking about the cow, the ruminant animal? Yeah. And so here's a wildlife guy that everybody would said, well, a wildlife guy must hate domestic livestock and Sand County was all hailed out and that's where his farm was and those kinds of things. Rogler and Russ Moran's 1983 in the Mandan Research Station. When I read this, I saved it. I think about it all the time. Ultimate no-till system is the cow and grass. I have nothing against farming. I've farmed up a Dickens for a long, long time. And the problem was John Deere tractors, they didn't put a, a bathroom in them and a, uh, and a microwave. Otherwise, I could have really farmed. I could live in those John Deere tractors. And uh, I figured out that that wasn't, wasn't fitting some things, okay? Then, through a few, a few people here, a few people there, in, uh, actually it was 1982, when I met Alan Savory and company, in January of 82, I was at the first week-long course, HRM in practice, with the new textbook. And sometimes circumstances helps us to grow whether we want to or not. It's in Bozeman, Montana. Daytime temperatures are five below, nighttime temperatures are 30 below. That's even a little tougher than Bozeman usually has is none of us were winterized, none of our cars would start. And the motel, we were stuck there. So for 24 hours a day, we had education. That's how you form a management club because we all learn together. We had nothing else to do but learn. Alan had all of his staff there, Rowan Cruz, many of you know, the scene Raka, uh, all, all, they were all there. And so I read the book three times in one week. And I tell you I'm an addictive reader. The HRM model or holistic management, we talk about the land description. Folks, things I've learned since 1955 is that we overlook the goal. Folks are, you know, somebody will be talking to them and they say, gosh, what do you think I should do? Josh knows that I don't know anything because I can't answer that question. You know, I can't tell you what to do, okay? Uh, and, and Josh helps me to understand that. Is it, what's your goal? What do you want to do? People always tell me, well, you know what the goal is. On my plates, not on your plates, it's your plates. So, honest, think through this goal. And, and if it's been a while since you've done it, go back and look at it. Your land description, what do you want for your water cycle? I know what you want. You know, we, we saw that with Steve's presentation this morning. He wants to keep the water. He doesn't want to share it with anybody, okay? Effective mineral cycle, get that energy cycle going, and then all the community dynamics. When it started out, we were talking about people. You know, we didn't really think about biodiversity. We didn't think what was going on in the soil, and now it's growing, and there it's there. So there's all kinds of lessons I've learned, and you're learning new lessons, and we're continuing to learn. Uh, it took me a while to figure out how important the brittleness scale was, is, is a big important one. Uh, and then, you know, we start getting into watching the grass grow. I flagged a couple hundred plants to watch regrowth. All of a sudden, it starts to make sense, because Gene Goldman told me to do that. And anybody that knows Gene Goldman, he's been around, and he knows what's going on, so I flagged plants. And uh, that, was, that's, that was a big part of my education. And, and understand how grass grows and watching the recovery times. Uh, we work forever trying to match the stock to the resources and uh, you know that's what all of you are trying to do is to, to make things make them fit together and extend the grazing season because it's about money. We like to talk about tools. Here's a couple of our tools. Uh, we use bathtub mineral feeders as an animal impact tool. We try to have all of our feeders on some kind of a uh, easy easy to move them. We move them every time we go by and I had somebody say, but Jesus, you know, if you move them a hundred times in the summer, you've impacted an acre. What good is that? I said, it's really good to that acre. You know, I mean, you've got to start someplace. And so that's Teddy, you know, he's driving the thing. And now, now he thinks he's a tail gunner. You know, it all works the same. Uh, this doesn't show up. It's in the summer of 2008. It's, it's pretty dry. You can, if it's dark enough, you can see the green spots that showed up from, from when the, uh, uh, the, 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 the mineral tub was moved. We get some new grass, new growing with no, uh, no rain. Uh, I learned the phases one, two, and three of, of grazing management because phase one was pretty easy with too much disturbance. That's what we had. 
and we've converted all the cropland back to grass. And we've got some that's in phase two ready to grow, ready to grow. But we've got lots and lots of lots of it that's getting into phase three idolitis. It gets away from you. Now in, um, I think it'll be five years in February, we sold the cow herd, has a quality of life uh, issue. I, uh, um, I thought I could maybe make the cow thing work. I really like cows. My granddad was born in Scotland. He's, he was a stockman. So I'm part whatever. I guess there's where border collies come from, Scotland. I think that's, I think maybe I'm related to some border collie. I just like to follow cows around. <laughs> and uh, we, uh, we just couldn't make it work to be fair to people running cattle on shares and to stock the place. We just couldn't have enough animals. So we sold them, spent a couple of years doing some things, and now I discovered uh, uh, Steve Fetty. And uh, I, uh, I, I can't announce this. I don't know how many more idiots he can, excuse me, how many more people he can take on to groom them to, to run yearlings. It's a steep learning curve. And so uh, I call Steve often. I have him on uh, speed dial. He has me on don't answer those calls. <laughs> and then uh, later later we get back together and it works. But I mean, the things that I'm learning, but to get, to get enough stock, okay? To get enough density and the folks that i'm working with are pretty convinced although they have thousands of cattle scattered around the country so they, they've got lots of cattle they got lots of you know lots of stock tell me how many do you want and then when i tell them how many they say really I say, well, yeah because i want them in one herd and they like to have herds of 150 to 200 cows because that way they can kind of you know boys and girls get to know each other and socialize or whatever goes on i don't know uh, and so we started out slow. We started with 250 yearlings. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't know what I did. Oh, I guess we don't need to look at that stuff. That's things. Okay. Anyway, uh, I, the other day I ordered for the for the yearlings 601 herd. They <laughs> they got to think about it a little bit. We really need a thousand, but you know we'll work it. We'll get there to uh, to try and have enough stock to make the thing work. Uh, I've heard you already talk about these things today, and certainly I've had to learn about those things. I, uh, I uh, one year I had it all figured out. I had it totally figured out. Remember, I'm an ag economist, so I like to do budgets, and I got my pencil out, my calculator, because I'm old. I don't use spreadsheets. I had it all figured out. That uh, when people sell these uh, uh, these yearly heifers, I have a buyer that can uh, can eyeball them, and he'll pick those heifers that. Uh, uh, they should have been mama cows and we're going to calve the 17th and 20th of May. So we got a little window in there and get them home, we can turn a bull out with them and we'll get 85% of them pregnant because, you know, they've been you know, running without, uh, without boyfriends all summer. Okay. I think they do that. If you put them on a pasture with good nutrition, I tried putting them on a pasture that was going to, you know, see how much weight they could lose because I, I missed one of the steps in there. But we got about 75% of them bred, and it turned out to be some of the uh, the finest females we've ever had. And people said, well, how do you know where they come from? I said, well, they come from, from a sales room. Yeah, but he said, how, how did they get there? Now, I know what they're getting to. They want to know the bloodlines and where I was at. And uh, I'm just eating things to walk around and, and uh, harvest grass. So, you know, that was one of the tricks that we tried. But we needed, we, for us to get enough numbers, we had to, had to get really serious about the, the cow-calf business or go to yearlings and we decided that might be the easiest. Here's the old cow poetry. Uh, we've all seen this one. Uh, distant hills. The distant hills call to me. Their rolling waves seduce my heart. Oh, how I want to graze in their lush valleys. Oh, how I want to run down their green slopes. Alas, I cannot. Damn it. Damn you, Thank you. It gets back to training. And uh, I, uh, after I went to the Savory School, I was teaching at the uh, UND Williston, and lo and behold, they formed a committee. They they put in 250 bucks to cover that cheap little enterprise for us. I shouldn't say cheap; it was a very good investment. It just was ooh, a lot of money. It was more than 500 dollars. So I had to do a quick little report to the faculty, and I was all fired up. They gave my little report, and they said, Wayne, why don't you teach that to your students? I said, oh, I guess, uh, I don't know. So they had the curriculum committee sitting in the room, and everybody else, they all said, yep, 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 we can do it. Just write it up. I said, well, I have to ask Alan Savory. Well, who is Alan Savory? Well, I said, he owns this. What do you think Alan said when I called him up? Because at that time, Alan and or his staff was teaching it 
in motels here and motels there and you'd spend a week with them. What do you think he said? How many of you think he said, uh, how would he say it? <laughs> uh, anyway, how many of you think that he, he said no? He was, he was all in. You know, what can we do to help you? So we got started in the training thing and I got to start doing some uh, teaching. And the greatest way to, to learn holistic management is to teach at college students because they're really, really, really um, faithful. If they have no idea what you talked about today, they'll come back to the next class period and see if you can't make some sense out of it. Right, Melinda? Okay. Melinda, Melinda always tells me the truth. Okay, okay. So it was a way to practice. I did a lot of community things. But I remember one of the early times I was at a meeting and a guy said, well, you can talk about that electric question. Boy, I'm telling Boy, I got this old cow. And he'd tell me what this old cow would do and he just wouldn't quit. You know? So finally I said, you know, who's running that place? You were that old cow. <laughs> and he didn't really like that too much. <laughs> and so then I thought through something I heard once is that have a plan of your own or you become part of someone else's plan. All life is like that. Okay. It's, it, I've had people ask me what they should do on their farm or ranch. I'm really honest. I don't know. I don't even know where your farm or ranch is. I'm not sure I can find it. You know, if you gave me good turn by turn directions, don't give me a GPS address because I maybe will misinterpret that and I'll be at your neighbor's place. But you know more about your place than anybody else. You know, some of your third, fourth generation. Think about that. When you get the opportunity to walk across that pasture, like Trish was talking about walking with the grass squishing, you go barefoot so you can feel the grass squishing your toes, Trish? No, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I was worried. I was worried that <laughs> next week see you with a little, you know, flower in your hair and a few things. I was just, I'm glad you're not going there. I feel, I feel so much better. It's so nice. Okay. But as you're walking across your place, just think about it. If you're second, third, I met someone here today that's fifth generation. Hey, excuse me. I'm sorry. I apologize. So, Ladies and gentlemen, think of this. You're the fifth generation, the third generation. Somebody in your family tree has more than likely stepped on the same spot. What do you think of that? You go to New York City and you walk around, or you go to some office building and walk around, who cares who's walked there? Do they care if you're walking there? Nah, the only person that cares is the people that take care of the floor. They care, because that's the part they get to do. So you know that place. It's in your DNA. Now, somebody in the room here, if, if, hey kids, I do feel like the old college teacher today that got invited to a, to a class reunion or all school reunion and I bet I boomed away so long that I forgot who I am. Honest, honest, I do. I recognize a lot of you. A lot of you I've, I've, never, I, I've never seen before in my life, but I know why you're here and we're all here for the same reason. But think through that. That, that, that footsteps and who's been there. Okay, think through that. And, and then someone here, one of the one of the old timers, once told me that one of the beauties of planned recovery slash rotational grazing, planned recovery grazing, you get to spend time on the land and you start to listen to the land. And this is getting kind of zen, but it's true. You listen to the land, and the land starts talking to you. All we have to do is listen. And it'll talk to you. The solutions are there. Cover cropping is a, it, it, is a, is a wonderful deal. It's just mimicking what the buffalo and the wildlife and the Indians do. And that's good. We, we we're recognizing that and we're taking advantage of it. So, you know, there's... Uh, it, 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 it's, not, it's all pretty simple. The devil's in the details of keeping it simple. We reseeded a bunch of stuff. We reseeded, we, we added some switchgrass and, uh, you know, a whole lot of things. It makes no difference. It's going to, how your management is going to change what it looks like. Uh, we did a thing about, Jeff, how long ago was that? Was that in the early 90s we did the PMC planting with Montana North Dakota Plant Material Center? It's been a long time ago. I don't know if you get, if you got some Montana uh, NRCS folks around, they all tell you. You know, boy, if you'd have been there, they'll tell you because they all got forced into coming and clipping the, the small plots. So we see this some things. So there's a little big blue stem growing out in the middle of eastern Montana where it doesn't grow there, you know. 
this is Montana winter bat. Montana winter bat. Uh, some of you know Bart Carmichael, and the South Dakota guys know Car Bart Carmichael. Bart, this fellow I met 20, 25 years ago, and we chat quite often on the phone, and he uh, sometimes, moments of weakness, he tells people on his manner, but he's a little careful about that because he wants to be successful. His plates, all of a sudden, winter bat showed up pretty profusely. So he took a picture on his cell phone, sent it to 15, 20 of his friends and said, what is this? Some of them knew what it was. Now, the purpose of this quick little story, he was in a meeting and he showed it to a range professional. And Mark said, I asked him, I said, hey, I found this thing growing, what is it? And he said, the guy said, well, it's winter fat, but I wouldn't worry about it. Mark said, no, I'm not worried about it. The guy said, well, don't get too excited, it won't stay. Mark said, well, it's destroying my ranch. And the range professional told me, well, don't waste any more money buying seed. Where did it come from? It was there. So, so the point of that is, as you make changes, and then the neat thing when we started today, Chad said this is an opportunity to make community. And, and we're, you know, some of you come with your neighbors, some of you come as individuals. There's, uh, you know, there's there's three countries in South Dakota here. No, that's not fair. <laughs> uh, Australia. There's a lot of people represented in this group today. Try and make a real point before you leave to meet somebody new and, and exchange contact information because in this information age, that's a person you can call and you can ask them some questions. And, and you can and sometimes, here, here's what happens. We discover something or, or we see something and we're unsure. Uh, we talk about driving out fear of the livestock. What about your own fears? So we've been told if you make mistakes, it's good because it means you're doing something right. So don't be afraid to make mistakes. And when when Josh and I were doing the training, we'd always tell you, make the decision and assume you're wrong. You ever get anybody offered a whip at Josh when you say that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you mean? I'm positive-minded. I have a list of them. You have a list of them? Yeah, yeah, Josh keeps a long list and he's, he's got a good memory, he won't forget. But find some other folks you can bounce things off and, and I'm not picking on the professionals. They don't walk on the land like we do every day. I made a comment to Jody one day, and the other person, someone was telling her that they like something, and I made the comment to Jody as well, they can go right ahead and like it because they get a check on the 1st and the 15th of every month. Jody knew what I was talking about, okay? Well, it sounded good on paper, you get it out on the ground, and we're dealing with something, and it's still there, Jody, I can't fix it, okay? Well, you get the solution, you call me collect, I'll, uh, no, I, no, no, you pay for the bill, uh, whatever works, okay. So, that's the range profession, okay? If we can pick on them, let's pick on us. What is this? Oh, the name is there. It's red grass little blue stem. My God, I hate that blue stem stuff. It's that red crap that grows on the hillsides, right? Yes, sir. Oh, I hate that stuff. Which one? They won't eat it. Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> or is that a lie? There's a difference between bullshits and lies. <laughs> you figured out there's a book called on bullshit. You read that. It's a little thin book. There's a real difference between bullshit and lies, and it's important to tell the difference. Some people don't know which one they're doing. Cattle won't eat it? Well, if you starve them to it. Hey, I I had heifers, I had yearlings this year, and the heifer, the herd of heifers I spent more time with. They'd never been on the place. Their mothers hadn't lived there to teach them what to eat. I put them into a new paddock. They would walk around and find the Canadian thistle and the little blue stem and they'd pause and they'd stop and they'd graze. And then they'd go forth. Now, Roy, you've never been to our place. Long time. Long time. Lucky you, you haven't had to come back for a while. Okay. <laughs> a blue stem must grow different right there in eastern Montana than any place else if the cat eat it, right? Okay, you heard it from Lloyd. okay. So here's the point is that I get all excited, I found this new grass, and I ask one of my, my neighbors, because he's been around a long time, and he tells me, no, no, don't waste your time in that way, and find a way to kill it, because the cattle won't eat it. And maybe he hasn't gone to look at it, just sees the seed stock. So, you know, we can talk about picking on the professionals, because we know something in a different light than they do. So now let's talk about picking on each other, or is it us? You know, there's an old saying, I'll live the bastards. Just don't be one of the bastards. <laughs> okay. 
I'm an addictive reader. He has three good old books to read by Alamar Farm by Louis Brumfield. One of the highlights of my life with the Cheyenne Grassland folks, they were doing a workshop one summer. There was a guy there from Minnesota that grew up next to, to uh, Malabar Farm, and uh, what, what, he was in a treat. He learned some things in there. Gene Goldman figured that out, or else he rewrote the book. Gene used to have that Blainer Silver Cedar Combine, and he'd throw over quite a bit of his grain. If he adjusted, he could throw over a little. Gene, you're here. Where are you? Okay. <laughs> and then he would, he would pulse graze it in the fall. He'd have the cattle graze on it, take it off, let it regrow put them back on and let it raise it. He didn't care if he killed that stuff in the fall because it's going to die anyway. Gene, is it true that your soil condition, organic matter, went up faster on that solution than doing some other practices? I'll talk about it in a little bit. He's going to talk about it. Aha! Uh -huh. A pre uh, preview of future things to come. Plow and Smiley by Edward Faulkner. Boy, that'll make you think. Grass productivity, the Android voice in. I got my voice in out this summer. Earrings wouldn't gain. Uh, grass was getting away from us, and I went back and read it, and uh, not too bad. A couple more books, The One Star Revolution, and then he's got a second one out, and I can't pronounce Chicago's name. Uh, prefaces by Wendell Berry. And then Stan Parsons, his little ditty, you want to be a cowboy, get a job. I don't, that's, 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 you know, I don't want a job, I'm thinking I want to be a cowboy. You know, at that stage of my life, I just want to be with the cows. Okay? Because this is what the modern thing, what the young people said, that everybody wants to be a cowboy until there's cowboy stuff to do. Same difference. Okay? Grazing management, you're doing all of those things. I've heard about all of these tools here. We stumbled into those, stumbled out of them, and did some of those kinds of things. This is profound. Jim McDonald, someplace in, in southeast Manitoba. Where, where's the Manitoba guys? Yeah, you're, you're, okay, that's right. you're not in Manitoba. I do know Jim. Do you know Jim? How is he? No, he's all right. Oh, good. Oh, good. I mean, he's still well and good? He's well, he's... <laughs> he wasn't born in 42. <laughs> I'm, doing a, I'm doing a workshop in Boise, Maine, and they had a little, uh, they brought in a panel. And Jim had come to my very first class, and he should get a cash refund. He come to Carrington, North Dakota, and uh, so he's on his panel because he introduces himself. He starts out talking to this class, and he, he <laughs> nobody briefed him. So he says, "Well, if you ever have the chance after this class, you get a chance to meet Wayne Berry down in the states. You should go." And all, you know, he didn't know I was in the audience, which that was kind of cool. But anyway, he started his remarks out, and Jim said, "Well, according to Michigan State University research in Michigan." Cows like to walk around. Grass likes to stay in one piece, one place. And he was kind of saying it as a joke. Well, two things about it. There's a, a, a journalist, okay? Well, we don't need to identify the uh, the gender. There was a journalist sitting in the front. Boom, the head goes up, they wave, they wave, they wave. They said, Mr. McDonald, Mr. McDonald. He said, yes. They said, could we have the reference for that quote, for that research? Okay, well, they, want it, they put it in the paper. They want it to be true. I took that and figured, that's an aha. Uh -huh. It's an aha. Uh -huh. You guys that are doing winter grazing have figured out, cows like to walk around. Grass kind of likes to really stay close to home. Okay? Uh, they just proved in 1900, in an old book in England, with a hay field, when they put the manure back out there, or if the cows were to graze it in there, that it grows more the next year. You knew that, okay? Range management, the art and science. It's science. And it's art. Who teaches you art? I've taken art appreciation. They didn't teach me art. Who teaches us art? Jim? You've been on the cool seat, now you're on the hot seat. Who teaches you art? I'll help He, he got it. Art's in the eye of the beholder. Okay, he's got it. Okay. So look, observe, and you'll start seeing this. And then if you observe a while and you said, I'm not sure what I'm seeing, then major something so you can manage it. Your farm and your family knowledge. We talked about those generational farms, and if it's if you're if you don't have many generations into it, you got neighbors, you got somebody and somebody else, the group here, create mentorships. Get some folks, and in this day and age, there's no reason to not be connected to lots of people. You know, you can text them, you can tweet them, you can Crypto, you can always set up a prezi. 
That's way ahead of PowerPoint now. Okay. If I had Prezi to say light up and dance and just talk to you, it'd be, it'd be so nice. Okay. But since I'm retired, I don't have to do that. And the, the, the knowledge in your community. Yeah, that's an old, some kind of an old beater pickup. The windshield is a lot bigger than the, your rear view mirror. You got friends, you got family, some of them that are stuck in the past and they want to talk how it used to be, you know. I don't know. I don't know. That's, uh, some of us guys in here, we remember dancing with her. Right, guys? You old guys? Sally was a good old girl. Oh, yeah, yeah, they're all like, oh, good. I like Sally. Okay. So, uh, it's time to visit. I think we're done. Oh, nature, there are neither rewards or punishments, there are consequences. Consequences can be good, consequences can be bad. Any questions? I asked three, four, five people to give me some written questions to start, and they came up blank. <laughs> they must have some now. It's been, it's been a fun ride. I can't believe the things I've learned since that 4 H project. Uh, the one thing that I've observed, a couple things I've observed, is that it's easy to not force ourselves to come back to the goal. And it's human nature. We, we, I love tools. I love technology. This modern technology that you're using on farms and ranches, I'm just crazy about it. I just want to hear about it. I don't want to have to put up with the buttons, you know, and all the defaults that can happen. I don't want to pay for it, but it, it just amazes me. The, the modern bailer and, and the things it does is, I'm thinking maybe I should, you know, unretire and go back to bailing. I mean, it's just, it, you know, I mean, all the technology, it, it's there. So, you know, embrace the stuff and never see what you can do and, and build things. Yes, sir. What's, what's your magic for the for the crafts? My magic for the uh, the little Bruce yep. As far as how do you think I'll do it? Have you ever looked at it? No. Okay. No. You, if you look, most of the time you'll find that, it's, that the leaves have been been grazed off, uh, and it, it's a timing thing too. Uh, on that plant material planning, they had pure stands of little blue stem and big blue stem. The problem was I had fifty some acres in two and a half acre plots, and I, I, it was all grazed at one time. And there was there was one variety of little blue stem and one variety of big blue stem. At the time we turned the cattle in, it looked like we had fenced it off with electric fence. It wasn't touched. Now I don't you know these were all introduced or you know were, were new bread varieties. Uh, and so you know I've I've you know, I've seen patches that don't look like they're grazed. Uh, park the middle feeder on it to uh, do something if you. Uh, um, you know, some way on, on native range, I, I agree with Lance. I'm very, very uh, uh, reluctant to bale graze on, on native grass because you know we want what's there to express on bring something in. But if you can get it stomped back uh, so that it comes back and if they can graze it enough to keep it fairly fresh, and there, there's some areas you've got lots of acres of maybe that's what you have. Two smaller patches. Smaller. Okay, I've seen places that it, it's just it's just covered. And so, yeah. So. I don't have a magic bullet. Just sooner or later, somebody will eat it. That's how I look at it. So, but yeah, sorry, I didn't have a good answer. Okay. okay. Well, I appreciate being here, Jed. Thanks for inviting me. Um, well, I I I retired. The last <laughs> I've done this talk kind of once before. A little joke is I was I was retiring. It was my final whatever they call it when they do the big concert tour. I had two things to do. One was for Eco, uh, not Eco yet. Uh, some project. We had fun. And then my final thing of my final thing was going to be for the Eastern Montana Association of Conservation Districts. People that are they're all near and dear to my heart. They gave me 45 minutes to tell them everything that I had learned because they wanted to they wanted to know what I'd done. Ray Bannister was part of setting me getting me into that deal. And as you would know, I'm on the 45 minutes before dinner, and as they went through the meeting, there was a lot of important stuff to talk about, some other stuff to talk about, some other stuff to talk about. I got down there was 14 minutes until noon. And uh, I smell we don't smell the roast beef. <laughs> they, the chairman said, I don't know what we should do, Wayne. Maybe you should give your talk and we'll just do dinner late. And I said, no, we can't do that because I'm sitting next to Jim. And he drove four hours after he got up this morning. He's hungry. Jim said, I'm hungry. Okay, so that's out. When he said, you can come on right after lunch and do it. I said, no, I can't do that because you got a program. He said, what should we do? And I said, if you sit down, I'll stand up. I'll get done. So I, I apologize for taking this long because I did it in six minutes that day. It was really good. I'm going to show you I did well today. 
And when I used to do workshops, I honestly believe that I'm the least important person in the room. And I mean that sincerely. Because you're the important person on your room, and collectively you have the answers. I'm just just a catalyst. Okay? I'm getting the questions down, and you helping me get the goal. And that, that's what Josh is trying to do. Okay? You know, sometimes if you, you get together, you say, that dog on Josh, he'll never answer a question. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't have the answer to nothing. That's good. That's good. I'm proud of it. Because Josh and I cannot run your ranch. Even if we wanted to. Because we're not there. Okay? So don't put pressure on Josh to do that stuff. But keep after him. Because, you know, keep him, keep him thinking. Keep him going. Because that, that's what keeps him sharp and keeps him going. So I appreciate the chance to be here. My wish is that everyone who has a, a great winter and the next summer your, your grass grows where you want it to. And it stays right there and your critters all walk around and fight. Thank you.